or you just type about this. Maybe you can just go ahead and type the greatest event. You will come across a lot of thing which they, the Google, describes as the, you know, the greatest event. Okay. Some may be, you know, I will explain to you when we talk about this greatest event, the definition should be that the greatest events in history are those which affect the greatest numbers for the longest period. Okay. So it is not bound to one particular region. It is not bound to one particular culture. It is not bound to one particular continent. It should affect the greatest numbers for the longest period of time. And it should be all. It should include all. So that's the definition of the greatest event. Now, when you type in the Google, the world will list those greatest events, though they have not witnessed it. They will name them as maybe the Neolithic Revolution, where man started, uh, you know, instead of hunting, they moved from hunting to farming. So that's the Neolithic Revolution. Maybe the rise of a great empire called Mesopotamia, where the modern day Iraq. Or maybe they will say the rise of empires like Greeks, the Romans, or maybe the industrial revolutions and the Enlightenment era. Okay. Maybe the Google will even say you that. Or maybe the greatest even could be where many thought would be the end of the world. And that's the reason why they call it as World War I. Just for your information, when the World War started, it was never termed as one and two. They termed as third, they termed it as World War One. They never knew that this would end because everybody thought that's the end of the world. And then the plagues, announcements of plagues. Now, when when you you know see about all these announcements, the greatest announcement would be as in Luke 24, verse 5 and 6. Well, this is the greatest announcement. This is the greatest, greatest, greatest announcement of all time. I would say it as G-E-O-A-D. The greatest event of all time. And that is in Luke chapter 24, verse 5 to 6. It says, where the angel is saying, he is not here. He is risen. Somebody say with me an amen for that. The very thing that we are all sitting here for the Bible study. The very reason, or maybe the, 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 the very result is because of this very statement or declaration, which is one of the, you know, there is nothing in history to equal that one histrionic event declaration, which says he's not here, he is risen. Well, yes, some of you wrote the rapture, the coming, Jesus coming to earth, the resurrection, yes. You said it all right. Rapture, yes, not, not really the greatest event, but the greatest event the world has ever witnessed till date is the bit, is the is is the statement of the coming of God in human flesh. That's the event which is one of the most which has affected the whole world, which has shaped the empires which have nurtured the, the philosophies, which have actually, you know, cuddled all, in modern terms, leadership qualities, is this particular God-man called Jesus. 
All right. So as we embark into this in the into this journey of knowing what is this greatest event, I want you to, you know, put on your seat belts. Maybe if you don't have it, and just listen because this is gonna tickle your ears. If you have heard it once, praise God. If you have never heard it, this would tickle your ears. This would even convict your hearts. Who knows the Holy Spirit can, when you are listening to me at this point of time, the Holy Spirit can convict your hearts. So before we start any further, as we have started this class, can I ask all of you to close your eyes? And we will just pray that the Lord would convict our hearts. Father, this is your word. Speak to each one of us. The greatest event as we explained was not the revolutions or the resolutions or the wars or the enlightenments, but Lord, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the next greatest event would be as we all as a church waiting for is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ again. And we pray, God, that you may speak to us, enlighten our hearts, that, Lord, every one of us may be convicted. And we will say from the bottom of our heart that, Lord Jesus, you are the Lord and the Savior. As your word says, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow down, Confess that Jesus is Lord. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and enlighten our minds and our hearts. Speak to each one of us. Enable, give me enablement for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes. Let's move forward as we all know what is the greatest event. The greatest event is when God became man. The greatest even was when death was defeated. The greatest event was when sin was defeated and the redemption was attained. And this cost was too high. And that's the greatest event. And that's the reason why, why this is called as the greatest event because this would have not been possible if God wouldn't have taken the initiative. And this event, we call it, you know, uh, in the in the Old Testament, in in the kings, in the in the era of kings and rulers, one country will go for war with another country, okay. And as the war is about to end there would be messengers in those war areas who would be waiting for the omen. Maybe in other words, they will be waiting for the click in terms of whether this kingdom is going to lose or they're going to win. So these messengers would actually wait. And as the war is, by the way, war is not ended. War is about to end. It is like, you know, this messenger has been convinced that this particular kingdom is going to win. This messenger, there would have been a competition. There will be a lot of messengers. Okay, The competition would have been within this messengers to run. To run and to declare to the kingdom back who whether you are winning or whether you are losing. So there will be this competition among the messengers. And these messengers, maybe there would be 100 messengers. There would be maybe few, 10 messengers or so five messengers. These messengers would be, you know, the moment they are convinced, they see and they're convinced that they're going to win or they're going to lose, they will run. And they will run, they will run, they will run. And they will not stop. They will run for the whole day, maybe. They will run for the whole day without stopping because they want to give this news first to the people back home. And these people would come. The moment the people back home also, they would be waiting on the hills 
because this news is coming and the messenger is coming from the hills. And these people here in the city, they will be looking onto the mountains and they would be seeing if there is any movement of soil or any movement of dust or any movement in that place, they will be watching from, from with their eyes and they will be watching, every one of them will be watching. And the moment they will be watching and they see that the runner is coming, he is coming little slowly, he's coming with tired eyes, tired legs, he's fumbling, the people will know that news is not good. But the moment when the people see that the runner is coming with full enthusiasm, the runner is coming with full power, and he is shouting, he is lifting his hands. When the people see there is there is so much of dust which he is actually you know producing when when he is running on the on the hills, the people will know that this person is bringing a good news. So our word gospel comes from those terms. In verb, Hebrew word is beser. It's a verb. And the Hebrew noun would be besera. The Greek word would be eonglion. You, are, you would have heard of it many times. Beser, noun would be besora. That means the announcement. Now this word beser or besora in Hebrew was not used how it is used today. For example, today we say the word news. It can be any news. It can be small news, big news. It can be, you know, the gossip. It can be this news. It can be, you know, something which has happened. Nobody is concerned about or something which has happened where everybody is concerned about. So it can be used. The word news is for everything. But in those, in those days, the word Becerra would be only used for the national announcement. I'll come to that. And the Greek is Evangelion. Evangelion comes from the two word you plus Anglion. You means good. Anglion means announcement. Again, the word Anglion comes from the word Angelos. Angelos means angel. And one who delivers the message is known as Angelion, okay, or Anglion. So let's see what is this good news. The word gospel is derived from the Anglo-Saxon term. Okay, you, this is this. Let me just tell you, first there was this Greek culture. The language was Greek. There were so many Greek-speaking people. The whole world was speaking Greek. Maybe it was like, like as in today, the English languages. In those days, it was Greek. Even during the time of Jesus, the most common language was Greek. And after the Greek, they came to the next term. They came, the next language which became very common was Latin. And after the Latin, the most common language became was Anglo-Saxon. And after the Anglo-Saxon term, uh, the language, it was our English. And today it is English as, you know, the world's most spoken language. The word is derived from the Anglo-Saxon term, which means God plus spell. In Anglo-Saxon, gospel means God plus spell. That means good story. It is a rendering of the Latin evangelium, which comes from the Greek evangelion, meaning good news or good telling. Eu which is the prefix, which refers to something that is good and pleasant. Okay, you have so many English words, which means, um, you know, so many good uh, English words starting from EU. Maybe you can, if you remember something, you can put it in the chat. Some of the words, it starts, English word starts with EU. And it means good or it can means pleasant. If you remember those words, jump into your laptop, take your keyboard, and just type some of those words which starts from the word EU. And the word gospel literally means good news. And it occurs 93 times in the Bible. Exclusively only in the New Testament. The word gospel is only in the New Testament. But from the Greek word evangelion, 
we get the english word evangelist evangel evangelical okay so it all comes from this greek word euangelion see angelion as i mentioned before the word angelos or angelion is a word for message and angels are messengers and angelos is one who delivers a message okay so i hope this is very clear to you so remember this the word gospel let me just tell you this today when we speak about the word gospel it has become one of the spiritual word exclusively used in the christian circle but that was not the case in the those days in the roman era they pronounce the king they would call it as a gospel yes maybe today this term gospel has become one of the most religious term exclusively used for the christian uh, you know message but in those days in the in the roman emperor in the greek time the word euangelion was used for announcement any announcement any sort of announcement that you make was known as euangelion so let's see the word in the old testament if you can come and turn your bible to first samuel chapter 4 verse 17 for samuel chapter 4 verse 17 you will see the word besir okay which means the announcement look at this verse 17 says so the messenger answered and said israel has fled before the philistines and there has been a great slaughter among the people also your two sons hophni and phinehas are dead and the ark of the lord is been captured the ark of the lord is been captured okay so you see this is this is the announcement which the author is or the messenger is making here the announcement of the news of what has happened in the war okay the announcement of the news for what has happened exactly and this messenger is actually coming and giving you this word and the word used there is besir in verse 17 says and the besir answered the messenger is known as the besir and it is used in first samuel chapter 4 verse 17 it is a national announcement it is a major announcement it is something which is like the most which affects the whole 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 uh country or the nation or, or, or whole country or the kingdom okay that's the word which is used here and that is besser and look at some of the you know some people say you know the gospel was the derivation in the new testament the new testament people came up with this term gospel let me just give you the good news the term again in isaiah chapter 40 okay this is the good news in the old testament which was prophesied how many years back close to 800 years before the coming of the lord jesus christ okay verse 9 and 10 let me just take this verse for you isaiah chapter 40 verse 9 and 10 it says you who bring the good news o zion you who bring the good news again the word here the good news the word used is basar basir okay you bring the good news to zion go up on a high mountain you who bring the good news i want you to remember the in the the illustration which i gave you in the beginning of a messenger who is running to give the news to the people okay so you who bring the good news to zion go up on a high mountain okay go up on a high mountain you who bring the good news to jerusalem again you 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 who bring the besser to jerusalem lift up your voice with a shout lift it up do not be afraid say to the towns of juda here is your god see the sovereign lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him so see the first announcement of the good news was given by prophet isaiah when he is saying that the lord will come with power and he will rule you want to know what is the good news this is the good news the kingdom of god is the good news 
and his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. And the second good news, I wanted to remember the illustration again. Okay, I want to remember the illustration of the messenger who is running from the battleground and he is running towards his home or running towards the country where he belongs to. And he's saying something, you know, uh, he's actually declaring this news or pronouncing or Besser. He says he's a Besser who is giving the Besera and he's announcing something. And that's the, I wanted to remember that very thing. And look at this one, Isaiah chapter 52, verse, and how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings the good news, who brings the beser. Amen. And as we move in to the New Testament of what the gospel is, let me just tell you some of the announcements, some of the pronouncement of the good news look at this luke chapter 2 verse 13 and 14 that was the beginning of the good news suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared in the with the angel praising god and saying glory to god in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests this was the beginning of the announcement of the good news John chapter 1 verse 29 when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and he announces this to the people he announces to the entire crowd standing there and he says look the lamp of God who takes away the sin of the world sin of the world Matthew chapter 28 verse 5 and 6 the angel of the Lord said to the women who were who came to see the body of Jesus the angel of the Lord said do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified he is not here at this point of time. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. That's the announcement. That's the gospel. Matthew chapter 28, verse 5 and 6, where Jesus is announcing this to his disciples. He's saying, you know what, guys, go and share the gospel. Go and share this good news. What good news? The good news of the kingdom of God, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority, not just some part of the world, not just some, some things of this world, not just one power or one authority. All authority, whether in heaven or in earth, has been given to me. That means they are all, they were made for God, for Lord Jesus Christ, and they are made through him and to him. And all authority has been given to him, and he runs the entire world in his wisdom. That's the announcement. That's the greatest announcement. Okay, these are the New Testament announcement of the good news. Let's see the, the preview or maybe the review of the gospel or the good news and what exactly happened and why it is called as the good news. We will see it. See, I want you to know that God made a perfect world. When God made a perfect world, he placed man and women in it. And when he placed man and women, he asked them to be a good steward, to take care of what God has already made, to maintain, to be a manager of the entire thing what the Lord had made. The, the, the responsibility of man and women was to give glory to God. See, man and women were made for the glory of God. Man and women were not made for the glory of themselves. They were made for the glory of God. But what happened in this perfect world? Sin entered. The first man and the woman sinned. Humanity and the rest of the creation were plunged into darkness as sin entered this world. Genesis chapter 3 explains it clearly. One of the tragic incidents, if you, when, when we say that the greatest event of this world is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, well, the greatest tragedy of this world was this. Genesis chapter 3, where man and women, in their quest to become God, they sinned. They fell short of the glory of God. And because of that sin, humanity and the rest of the creation were plunged into darkness. Romans says that the entire creation is groaning for the revelation of the sons of God. That means the whole world till now is groaning. 
they are groaning for the revelation, for the coming of the Lord the second time. You remember the announcement of the angels? Peace on earth. Peace is something that the Lord actually wants. But this was marred when the first man and the woman sinned. But God is gracious. He has not given up on us. That's the good news. You want to know what is the good news? This is the good news. That God could have actually just left us there or in our sins and never to turn back. But God is gracious. That from eternity past, God had a plan to rescue the fallen humanity. From the beginning of this world, he made way for the entire humanity. I want all of you to turn to Genesis chapter 3. And I'm going to explain to you about the sin which, which actually plunged the entire humanity and the creation into darkness. I want all of you, if you are here, please turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 3. I want you to mark your Bibles and this is very good for you. You can mark your Bible with pen or pencil. Write it down if you find, if you if you want to write in the side notes, footnotes, just write it down. Verse 1 says the serpent was most cunning. Who made the serpent? The Lord made the serpent. And the serpent said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did God say that? You, you see what the devil is saying? Bible says that the devil is a liar. He's, he is lying from the beginning. Okay. What in fact, what indeed did the Lord say to Adam and Eve? What did he say to Adam and Eve? If you turn to the previous chapter, okay, to the previous chapter, verse 15 and 16, why did God, as I told you, God made a perfect world, placed man and woman in it? Verse 15 says, chapter 2, verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. You see, that's what the Lord put uh, man and woman there. And verse 16 says, this is what the Lord commanded. Look at what the Lord said and look at what the devil said. Okay, The Lord said, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Verse 17, except one, except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. But what did the devil say? Chapter 3, verse 1 says, as God said, you shall not eat of every garden, every tree of the garden. You see the lies. This is how the devil works. He twists the word. He says the exact same word. But he will twist one of those words and he will tell you and he will confuse your heart and mind. That's what the Bible says. He's a liar from the beginning. Revelation chapter 20 refers to Revelation chapter 12. Okay. And 20 verse 2 refers to devil as a serpent. Which suggests that Satan actually used the form of an actual reptile. That means he transformed himself as a reptile. This enhanced the shrewdness of the temptation. It came in disguise. It is not until the Revelation chapter 12 verse 2 that we get confirmation that this reptile, which was the serpent, was Satan. And his intention was to dislodge Eve from the clarity of God's word. Did God actually say that you should not eat of any of the tree? No, God did not say. God, in fact, said you can eat of any of the tree of the garden except for the tree of knowledge and evil. It was an attack on God's character. It was putting a doubt in Eve's mind about the character of God. From the serpent's question... It carried a deeper sense. What kind of God would deny you pleasure and joy if he really loved you? You know what, Adam and Eve, listen to me. 
what kind of God is this who would say, don't eat from any of this? How will you survive? How will you live? Who will take care of you tomorrow? Tomorrow, think about tomorrow. You will die. The lies of the devil. Verse 2 says, the woman said, look at the moment the devil gives the lies, look at the statement changed what Eve said in verse 2, chapter 3, verse 2. We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. I want you to turn to come back to chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Verse 16 says, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Verse 17 says, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. I want you to compare this verse 17 with chapter 3, verse 3. What Eve says, Eve have added something there. Okay, look at what she has added. She has said, she said, you shall not eat it. Okay, that's fine. You shall not even touch it. Did God say that? No. God did not say any of these things. Means God did not say that particular word. So she added to the word of God. And then the serpent said, you know what, Eve, you will not surely die. God knows, verse 5 says, that the moment you eat, your eyes will be opened. You will become God. You will know what is right and what is wrong. Have you ever thought about the animals? They don't have any knowledge of good and evil. They don't know what is right, what is wrong. They, they live in their, how they, you know, how they are made. If they are beast, they will attack and kill. If they are innocent, they will become a food for the the one who is attacking them. They don't have, they don't, they don't feel ashamed of the nakedness. They don't feel some, what they are thinking about you. They don't feel how the family, they don't feel anything. The devil says, the devil here makes a statement. He says, you know what? Now he says partial truth. He says, God knows that your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's what That was right. The moment you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will know what is... You know what was the plan of God? The plan of God was eternity without the knowledge of good and evil. Because the moment you know what is good and evil, you will fall. So the woman saw the tree was good for food. It was pleasant for her eyes, desirable to make one wise. She, verse 6 says... She gave, she ate, she gave it to her husband who was with her. All this while people used to think, you know, husband, you know, husband was somewhere far away. No, no. Look at verse 6. It says, she also gave to her husband who was with her at that point of time. And they ate. And the moment they ate, verse 7 says, both of them, their eyes were opened. And they knew at this point of, till now, they didn't know that they were naked. Okay, if you want to know the proof, look at verse chapter Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25 says, they were both naked. Look at this word. I wanted to turn, mark it, underline it. They both were naked, but they were not ashamed. Okay, and come to the next chapter, chapter 3, verse 7 says that the eyes of both of them were opened and they suddenly felt that they were naked. They felt they were ashamed. So what they do? What did what what did they do? They started religion. You want to know the definition of religion? This is in verse seven. They sewed the fig leaves together and made themselves covering. This is the definition of religion. Any attempt of man to cover the nakedness is known as religion. So if you have never heard this, I wanted to listen to this again. Any attempt of man to cover their naked soul is known as religion. All the religions will tell you, do this, do that, go there, go here, come there, come here. Offer this, offer that, give that, give this. 
this is the, the definition of religion. If you follow this, this sets of rules and regulations, this will save you. That's religion. That was not started by some people now or some people years ago. That was started by Adam itself. In verse 7 says, he sewed fig leaves together and he made them self-covering. Let me just tell you, that is not the plan. When God saw that man and women have sinned, you know what did he do? Look at this number, chapter 3, verse 8 says that first thing God is, uh, uh, verse not 8, before that, before that, verse 10 says, you know, God is saying, where are you, Adam? He's searching for Adam. What is the, what, what are we, what, what is this gospel? Gospel is a good news of the reconciliation between God and man. Look at this. Before that, God used to come in the cool of the garden, as verse 8 says. And you know what? God would talk to Adam. God would sit with Adam. God would actually, you know, talk and talk and God would enjoy Adam. And Adam would enjoy God. And look at this point of time. God is like asking, Adam, where are you? And that's the heart of God. Even today, God is calling each one of us by name and saying, where are you? Charles, where are you? So and so, where are you? And look at the answer of Adam in verse 10. Three things he said. Number one, I was afraid. Number two, I was naked. Number three, I hid myself. Because of the standard of this living God, man is trying to hide themselves from this from this righteous God. He is trying, is attempting to reach God by suing himself fig trees, but that he knows in the deepest of deepest way that will not cover his nakedness. He is still making it. 2,000 or maybe 3,000, maybe 5,000 years have gone by. Still, man is still suing fig trees, fig leaves to cover his nakedness. Because he's afraid. Because he's naked. And he's hiding. And then the whole story begins. And look at, I want you to, God gives, you know, the, the curse. First of all, the grace of God that he takes away man and women out of the Garden of Eden. Because God did not want Adam and Eve to live in the fallen state and remain eternal. Just imagine, nobody would actually, if they eat from the tree of life, what will happen is the moment they eat from the tree of life, they will become eternal and they will live in the eternal way in sin. That's the reason God took away the Garden of Eden. It was not for the bad of Adam, it was for good. You know why? Because from the foundations of this world, God have actually planned to save this humanity, to rescue the fallen humanity. And I want you to come to verse 21. That's what my whole thing is. Also for Adam and his wife, law, his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and he clothed them. Let me ask you, in order to make the tunic of skin, what would, what should have been done? To make a tunic of skin, an innocent animal would have been slaughtered. When the innocent animal who didn't know any of the, he who was not involved in any of this thing, who was not knowing any of this thing, he was murdered, he was slaughtered. For what? To cover the sin of Adam and Eve. Let me just tell you, that's the thing which is powerful. Some people ask me, what is the requirement of the, the sacrifice or the blood? What is the requirement? Well, God could actually just come down and say, you know what, guys, all of you are forgiven. Well, God did not do that because the Bible says God is a just God. He is a loving God. He is a just God. If he is a just God, he cannot just come down and say, you know what, guys, I forgive everybody. He is a loving God. Yes, he will say, I want to forgive all of you. But he is a just God. He, there need to be a solution for this. And what was the solution God gave them? God knew that Adam and Eve's way of attempting, of reaching this God would be of no use. So he who cut the animal? God had to sacrifice an animal at the Garden of Eden. God had to cut it, cut the animal, slaughter the animal, take the tunic and to give it. Look at verse 21 says, Adam and his wife, wife, for Adam and his wife, God made tunics of skin. God made it. 
It is not Adam who suddenly said, okay, fine, you know what? Let me just discover a new way of covering myself. Oh, I think the best way to cover myself is stay. Oh, lion. I think this lion would actually be a better option. His skin is thick, you know? Oh, what about buffalo? I think let's first slaughter the buffalo. Come here, come here, buffalo, come here, come here. I just want to slaughter. No, no, no. It was not that way of doing it. It was God who cut, slaughtered the first animal to cover Adam and Eve. So God is gracious from eternity past. He had planned to rescue the fallen humanity. He chose one man. Every generation, he chose one man. He chose a nation so that he, through this nation, he could reach the entire world. So that ultimately through one savior, he would save the entire humanity. He would save the entire humanity. Yes. Brother Shelley, you wrote it very right. God offered the first sacrifice for Adam and Eve. And also later, he offered his son for us. Very rightly said. And thank you, Levelin, for that word, eology. Yes, thank you. So God chose one man so that through him, it's one man and one nation, so that through the Lord, and then ultimately through one Savior, he would save the entire man. You know what? In order to give the one man or one nation the, the measuring stick, God gave the Old Testament. The law was given. If you read it from chapter 5, verse 1, you will know to Israel during that time the law was given. Why, why was the law given? It was given to show the standard of God. And if anybody knows that this is the standard of God and anything that falls even by one, one centimeter or even by one millimeter down, it was called as falling short. And that was called as sin. What is the definition of sin? Sin is like this is the standard of God and you are you are only up to here. And you know what? Nobody can reach that standard. The righteous requirement of law was so stringent that no human being could possibly follow it perfectly. Neither in letter nor in spirit. None of them could actually follow the requirement of the law. How could this generous God, how could this loving God make such stringent rule? And he knows that none of them would actually, you know, why was this law given? It was given as a mirror so that we will know what is the standard of God. As Paul explains this very rightly. God, the son, left his place in heaven, took the human flesh, born to virgin Mary. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life on earth and died an atoning death. He hung on a Roman cross. God poured out his judgment for sin on him, satisfying God's justice. He died there, was buried in the borrowed tomb. Three days later, God raised Jesus from the dead, proving that his death was sufficient sacrifice once for all. Now you don't need to shed blood because ultimately once for all, this blood was shed on the cross when Jesus who was God, became man and sacrificed himself, sacrificed for the sin of yours. He was sinless. He was perfect. He didn't have sin in him. In him. He was born sinless, sinless perfection. That's what the theology call him. But God made him sin for you and for me. And you know what? After appearing, when he defeated death the third day, we just now read the women came to the tomb and they said, where is this Jesus? And this angel said, you know what? This Jesus whom you are looking, he is not here. He is risen. After appearing to his followers, Jesus was taken up into the heaven. In front of all the 500 people saw him. And these 500 people, they saw with their naked eyes, this Jesus who, was, who lived with them. Who died was was he died on the cross and he was buried in the tomb. The big stone was rolled on his tomb so that nobody could, and it was guarded by the Roman soldiers. But nothing could stop him. He rose again the third day, defeating the death. He right now sits at the right hand of the Father until he returns to judge. The entire world. If you are listening to me and you have been, you know, if you are here, if you have been wanting to obey the Lord, I have shared this 
gospel in a very nutshell. You know, the entire Bible is a gospel, actually. But I've shared it in a very nutshell. And you want to know the, the Roman, you know, Paul explains in the book of Romans, he explains the Roman road. We say it as the Roman road of salvation. This is the Roman, you know, by the way, it was R.C. Sproul who said, the gospel is about Jesus. What he did, his life of perfect obedience, his atoning death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, and his outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church. This is the gospel. And you want to know the Roman road? You want to take the picture? You want to take a screenshot? Completely, go ahead and do that. Whom is this gospel concerned? Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says, None is righteous, not even one. That means no religion can claim that they know God. And that they are righteous. That they have found the way to God. No religion. Because nobody is righteous. Not even one. That's what Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says. And verse 23 says, all have sinned, every one of them born from day one till today, every one of them, they have all sinned and they fall short of the very standard of God. So why this gospel? Why it is called a good news? Just imagine you were actually, real. very lately we heard about the sentence of a 43-year-old young lady on the charges of drugs in a good country. When I was reading her ordeal, I was taken aback. She, she pleaded to mercy to all the officials, but none of them could save her. And then eventually last month, I think, on a Friday, she was hung. Sorry, she was, um, yes. She had to go through the gallop. She was hung. Just imagine you are in that place and you know that tomorrow is your death sentence. And that no powers of this world can save you. No amount of money can actually buy this thing for you called life. No reputation, no fame, no name can actually give, give you this, this particular salvation. And just imagine if in that case, God comes down and says, you know what? I will die on your behalf. And that's what Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Anybody who takes this gift and says, you know what, Lord Jesus, I have sinned. I have sinned. I want to accept that gift. And this is a gift. This is a free gift, by the way. You cannot purchase it. You cannot acquire it. You cannot, you know, get it from somebody. This is a gift exclusively from God. You cannot, no amount of money, no amount of your fame or name or, you know, any amount of things of this world can ever, ever purchase this thing for you because this is exclusively from God. Nobody can do anything out of it. Salvation is given to you freely. It is a gift and the gift is called a gift because it is free. And the moment you accept this, accept that gift, that's the time when you call it, I have received the gift. And Bible says, if you receive this gift of God, you will never die. In the place of death, you will never die. And how is this possible? Romans chapter, how is this possible? It is possible in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. By the way, this word, uh, what I've written is not the verse. Forgive me for that. I will, I will correct it. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was not like, you know, God was waiting for us to become right. God was waiting for us to become righteous. God was waiting for us that we hit the correct note. God was waiting for us that we, we do the right thing at the right time, at the right moment, at the right opportunity. God was not waiting for any of those things. He 
Bible says when we were still sinners, we were still walking towards eternal doom. We were still going towards the hell. And when we were still sinners, that Christ died for you and me. And what is the solution? Solution is simple. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and 13 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That means those who are about to take baptism, let me just make this very clear to you. Baptism is not to fill the religious obligation or it is not because somebody told you if you don't take baptism, you know what? You will be doomed. Yes, you will be doomed. Not because of baptism if you do not accept Jesus in your heart. Baptism you are taking because in your heart you believe that Jesus is Lord. In your heart you believe that God, that he came down and became man. In your heart you believe that he lived a sinless life. In your heart you believe that he was sinless perfection. In your heart you believe that he died on your behalf. In your heart you believe that he was raised from the dead. And in your heart you believe that God raised him from the dead. And then Bible says you will be saved. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, Bible says, will be saved. Everyone, anybody in this whole world, no matter what culture, creed, color, background, context, I don't care about any of those things. To the, to the worst to worst sinners, to the great to great saints, anybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And what is the result? Simple. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I will stop it here. This is a time. Yes, thank you, Levin, for writing um, this verse. God demonstrated his own love towards us that we, when we were still sinners, that Christ died for us and he, one second, yes, Christ died for us and he died for us for our sins. It was not that we, we were so perfect. It was not because, you know, we have something good in us. It is not because you know, we have a good legacy to follow, good legacy to actually show that to the Lord. No, we don't have anything because according to the Bible, we are all doomed. We were all doomed for hell, but Lord in his mercy. Even today, the Lord is covering some of the nakedness which the sin have exposed. This is just for your information maybe what i'm talking to you may maybe if it is this just an information maybe i have failed maybe if you have not accepted the lord as your lord and savior maybe this is a high time hey who knows tomorrow i don't know tomorrow will be there or not i don't know tomorrow i will be there i don't know tomorrow you will be there but bible says this is the day today is the day this is the right moment if you have been coming to church and you are not saved, it's okay. You can still accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you have been born in a Christian family and you think that you know being a Christian is a heritage or legacy that we have to follow. Well, it is not. Because Bible says every person individually have to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Not just confess it with your mouth and you know live as Bible says you have to make him Jesus is not just a savior, he's also the Lord. That means the day you are actually saved is the day when the Holy Spirit will give you the, 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 the salvation. He'll convict your heart and that day you will feel like crying. That day you will feel like weeping. That day you will, you will feel like you know weeping for all the sins that you have committed. And that day you will say in your heart, you know what, this is real. This is not some fake, some, something which has happened. This is real. And that day you will give your life to Jesus. And based on that confession, we do the baptism. 
it is not the other way. I think Pastor Philip shared it on the other way. We don't baptize and then believe. We believe and then we baptize. So may the Lord bless you. This is a time if any one of you have any questions or if any one of you have any doubts, you can either send me personally in my WhatsApp or call me personally. Or if you have anything you want to ask in public or you have any doubt, this is the time. I would request the media team to open this.